Nathan McCormick. And I'm Adam Chrisman. An Oral History of the Church is a conversational history podcast. This first volume is an oral history of the campus relocation of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary's main campus from Mill Valley, California to Ontario, California. The seventh episode for this volume is an interview with Dr. and Mrs. Kent and Katie Philpott. Now, Jonathan, um, I first heard about Kent Philpott as the pastor of one of the local churches around here. Mm -hmm. I soon came to learn that he is the pastor of Miller Avenue Baptist Church, located in Mill Valley, and which is, yes, the, the Golden Gate campus is in Mill Valley, technically, but there's really kind of two sides to the town, in a way. Yeah. Um, we are in a little part of it, a little suburb called Strawberry Point, and uh, it sits in between Mill Valley on the west and Tiburon, the town of Tiburon on the east. So um, if you go more to the west on the other side of the only north-south freeway in the county, you get to actual Mill Valley. Yeah, the 101 runs straight between Mill Valley proper and uh, Strawberry Point. Uh, and everybody's going down the 101 either to get into or get away from San Francisco. Right. So, what's significant about this interview is this is our first episode with a uh, pair of interviewees. Uh, most especially, of course, this is a married couple. Um, they've been married for uh, several years now, maybe uh, six or eight years. I forget exactly when they got married. This is, uh, as I mentioned, the pastor of Miller Avenue Baptist Church and his wife. Both are alumni of the seminary, so both came here as students, but they came at very different times, which they will talk about. I won't spoil that anymore. And for that, I, I found that uh, especially interesting. Very different perspectives on life as a student, uh, while at the same time a lot in common, coming at it from, they came in completely different kinds of decades too very different cultural issues going on very different uh, uh, seminary situation with faculty and and denominational stuff and all of that uh, was all different and they both had uh, some very interesting experiences uh, Kent spoke the most because he's as you'll you'll hear a lot more about he spent a lot more time here uh, in this area he was saved in the East Bay and then mm -hmm. spent uh, a large majority of his life so far here in Marin County. Methodologically, the literature does give both positives and negatives of having combined interviews. Mm -hmm. I thought it was at least worth taking a shot and seeing how it would go, and I'm quite pleased at yeah. the way the interview turned out. I think they really complemented each other and I think we got a better interview than what we would have had if we had interviewed them separately. I completely agree. Um, I'm really grateful for the time that they took out of their very busy uh, schedule. They are ministers, as we already mentioned, at that church, Miller Avenue Baptist mm -hmm. Church. They run their own publishing company with uh, Christian literature uh, regarding various ministerial literature as well as uh, polemical and evangelistic texts. Um, they uh, and they have a they have a lot going on. And before we get, I think, too much further into it, let's go ahead and set some time aside for Kent and Katie Philpott. This is Jonathan McCormick and Adam Christman interviewing Kent and Katie Philpott on April first. 2016. This interview is taking place at Miller Avenue Baptist Church at 285 Miller Avenue, Mill Valley, California, 94941. All right. Well, Kent and Katie, thank you for sitting down with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're hoping to talk to more uh, folks who uh, either have direct experience with the seminary, such as each of you did in your own time. Uh, and others who are uh, 
staff and uh, and lay people at local churches as well in the area. So um, you are the first folks we've interviewed who aren't currently uh, employed by or studying at the seminary uh, so far in this process. When did you first hear about Golden Gate <laughs> Seminary? This would have been uh, probably... I became a Christian in 1963 through the ministry of Pastor Don, um, Bob Lewis, First mm -hmm. Baptist Church of Fairfield. He was at different times a trustee at the seminary, mm -hmm. and different professors would come to preach. His favorite was Dr. Carlton, mm -hmm. uh, who taught here for a long at, at Golden Gate for a long time, and so we had various. Professors come and preach uh, when Pastor Lewis was gone. And on one occasion, our choir, I sang in a choir. We came down to Golden Gate for some kind of thing. There was a bunch mm -hmm. of choirs. And so I was actually here, hmm. probably in 1964. And I was going to be a school psychologist. I was doing a master's in psychology at Sac State. Hmm. And it was just moving into the counseling part and I had head of the department um, he was a you know determinist diehard atheist and he gave me all kind of trouble and uh, I'm, <clears throat> I realized that I would never be able to really be a Christian in a school context hmm. and so talked to Bob Lewis about it and uh, I connected with the seminary, and I was in the military. I was at Travis Air Force Base. I was a medic for four years. And one day in August, my last day of the military, I moved that very day to 10A Judson Lane, <laughs> Golden Gate Seminary. Mm -hmm. yes. So th it was those contacts mm -hmm. uh, from the visiting preachers and the choir event. Mm -hmm. That acquainted me with Golden Gate. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and Katie, what about you? Well, I moved to Marin County from uh, Seattle. That was from Philadelphia. That was from Baltimore. That was from <laughs> Ohio <laughs> in 1971. And there was a, a sign on the exit that mm -hmm. said Seminary Drive. Mm -hmm. And if you can believe, I did never went back there to check out if there was a seminary until well into the 2000s. Mm. <laughs> and, and this is probably, uh, I, I bet it's typical of most people who live in, in Marin, mm. that they know that there's something called Seminary Drive. They're not sure what that means. They've never gone back to check that there's actually a seminary there. They've mm -hmm. never driven up there. Unless word of mouth says, oh, the best view in all of the world <laughs> is from up there. Go yeah. up there and you can see San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I got there by way of having retired early in 2005. Mm. And then I really wanted to go to seminary, but I had never finished all of my undergraduate work mm. way back, way back. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had lots and lots of credits. I was starting to look at Dominican University. Sure. At that point, it was still calling itself college. And uh, thought, oh, I don't even want to study the stuff they have here. And it's very expensive. And then somebody told me, well, they have not just master's programs, but they have s lesser things. Hmm. They have certificates. They have um, diploma programs. Mm -hmm. And so I went over and at, and checked it out with the office and sure enough they would accept me into I guess the step down from master's is diploma okay yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, I could take all the same stuff as the MDiv mm -hmm. and I wanted the languages so I mm -hmm. I started off and a year later there was a notice on the wall that said um, if you meet the following qualifications, you're over 30, you've uh, been taking MDiv classes, your grade point average is this, mm -hmm. blah, 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 
come and talk to us, you can matriculate into the actual uh, MDiv, mm -hmm. which I met all the qualifications, fine, and I did, and mm. it was uh, the best thing. Yeah. It, I, those were the mo probably the most fun years I've ever had <laughs> in terms of uh, an educational oh, setting. Oh, yeah. It was a. It was just a riot. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, and I got to experience some of that being in yeah. some classes. With yeah, you. yeah, interacting with Dr. Faith Kim and oh, wow. uh, Dr. Gary Arbino. Those yeah. were fun classes yeah. to take. Yes, they were. <laughs> and Kent, you got the MDiv as well, correct? I got the, I got the, uh, got the MDiv. Okay. And. <laughs> But there's more to the story. Okay. I was, this was in the story. Jesus People Movement. Mm -hmm. I was pastoring a church 75 miles away in Byron mm -hmm. by Tracy, and I was fully engaged in the Jesus People Movement. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how it was. I've always been, people say I'm a workaholic, and I say, if you got to have a holic, that's not a bad one to have. <laughs> and uh, so I came back uh, for a THM, mm -hmm. and uh, that would have been in 1969. Mm -hmm. So I was away a year or two, I can't remember, and uh, uh, I had Richard Cunningham. Uh, he was a new hotshot assistant professor of theology. Okay. Great guy, and he was my major professor for three years. Mm. And um, I had Francis DeBose. Mm -hmm. uh, and Harrop for I did theology, Greek, and missions and evangelism. Mm -hmm. And it was then one day Dr. DeBose got up in a chapel and said they wanted two guys, they needed two people to volunteer for San Quentin. And so I did, and I was there for three and a half years until a George Jackson shootout in 72, and you'll see a lot of San Quentin mm -hmm. pictures. And I spent 17 years as the baseball coach, and all together, uh, I spent 30 years as a volunteer at San Quentin. But I, my THM, theology, my thesis was demonology and the occult. Hmm. And so I went through that, and uh, Dr. Cunningham signed off on every chapter, presented it to the committee, mm -hmm. And I went to my orals, my oral exam, and they gave me 26 objections. So I spent three, four months bringing that, came back, they turned me down again. I spent another three months preparing a new proposal, mm. and finally Dr. Cunningham said to me, they are never going to allow someone who speaks in tongues to have an advanced academic degree. Moish Rose of Jews for Jesus, who was my close friend, he said, you need mm -hmm. to sue the seminary. They knew that they weren't going to give you the degree from mm -hmm. the beginning, and they allowed you to spend three years and all of that money and all of that time. Yeah. But I refused to. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it. Zondervan published the book. It was my first published book. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was went into other languages, and I received royalties for about 20 years. Mm. It's still available. Huh? <laughs> Somebody pirated it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Go, yeah, yeah. Go, it goes about, into the public domain after I think I've got four or five now. books on Amazon that have been pirated over the years. Yeah. But, um, so anyway, that's an interesting story about, about Golden Gate. <laughs> but I got there, and one little story is interesting. In 19, August of 65, and there was a purge underway. Hmm. <laughs> uh, they were trying, they were trying root to out root Dominic out Wallace. liberal liberals. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we had a Old Testament professor. I believe his name was McClendon. Okay. Tall, distinguished man. James McClendon. Pardon? James McClendon. I think so. And they got, uh, he was there my first year, and they, they forced him into, they fired him. Mm. And uh, there was a, uh, a real purge. Uh, in fact, my pastor, Bob Lewis, was behind a lot of it. Mm. So, uh, 
So they were going undergoing the, the conservative liberal battle mm -hmm. when I was there, and it was just transitioning into more conservative. Mm -hmm. It was even uh, really paramount on the minds of a lot of our professors when you and I were there. Yeah. And I remember Arbino starting his uh, OT first class and talking kind of around the subject, always implying certain things, and finally said, and when I was interviewed for a professorship here, and they asked me, do you believe that, the, that there was a real parting of the Red Sea? He said, no. It was the Reed Sea. <laughs> it was a sea of reeds. Yeah. It was, it, was, it was in that situation, I think, that yeah. the, uh, they made all the professors sign a statement of faith. Mm -hmm. They still do. I think do. that was at that... Yeah, they still do. They still part. do. Yeah, they still do. And, um, <clears throat> and so I, spending six years at that seminary, I knew a lot of the professors pretty well. Yeah. And I hate to say this, you don't have, maybe you can edit this out. <laughs> but what they do is they'd end up just lying about it. Mm. They would sign the thing about the, the particular, there was a lot of dispensational theology developing as a, over against prehistoric, pre-millennial stuff. Mm. And uh, there was a battle for the Bible going on. And inerrancy and infallibility were big. They had to sign that, but they didn't believe it. Mm. They believed in inspiration, yeah, which is different. Mm -hmm. Which is a different thing. It's a, it, not requiring to take everything literally. Yeah, which inerrancy and infallibility carried with that concept, literalistic. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I know the guys over the years, and they would sign, mm -hmm. and they said, "Cross your fingers behind your back," sort of thing. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Anyway, it was a, it was a difficult time for a lot of the professors mm. at in the seminary at that time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you've had connection on and off with the seminary since the '60s, if I'm hearing your uh, your story correctly. Um, but our next two questions have been: How did you first come to the seminary, which we've We've walked through that, and mm -hmm. how long have you studied or been connected with the seminary? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any current connection with the seminary, either as a... How would you describe your relationship with the seminary? Mm -hmm. I've all, I love Golden Gate Seminary. I mean, it's occupied a major portion of my life. Mm -hmm. I've mentored a whole lot of students. Mm -hmm. At Clayton was has been the last, latest one. Yeah. Um, Shane Hedegaard, you know him. I don't know if you know Shane. Uh, he was he was the last two, but I've done a number of them over the years. Mm. He gets some unusual ones. I get the unusual <laughs> not, ones. Not your vanilla types. <laughs> Charlene Hyos. You know, when they meet him, they go, oh, send him to Miller Avenue. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Phil Pott will take anybody. So I've had that, con I've had that connection. Mm. And uh, so I would occasionally, the Hester lectures, some of the mm -hmm. major um, deals, missions, conferences, mm -hmm. I've attended those things. Mm -hmm. And your son. Pardon? Your son is a and student. And son, Ver Vernon, went, has, has gone there on and off a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always been very fond of the seminary. Mm -hmm. I'm, I realize it's important for the seminary to move, mm -hmm. but... Um, I'll miss it, yeah. and it's it's been a big part of my life since 1965. That's 35, 40, 51 years. Yeah, 51 <laughs> years. Yeah, most of yeah. the it, most of its history presence history here. here. Yeah, exactly. Most of its presence in Marin County. Here. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And just to clarify for the recording, uh, Clayton is Clayton Chamberlain, correct? Correct. Clayton Chamberlain. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right, so um, we've already talked about several of these questions here. Uh, our next one is, what are some of your favorite memories of, um, we ask it as studying or working 
at Golden Gate at this location. So maybe you visited other locations over the years, you know. But um, what are some of your favorite memories of the seminary, of the itself? seminary here at Mill Valley? Not sure that I any particular memories. Um, I love to hear the old time preachers preach. Mm -hmm. J. Winston Pierce were spats. Three <laughs> old times. They, well, at the seminary, everybody had a southern accent. Mm -hmm. All the people who worked that southern accent. Um, I was never in the club. Uh, to be in the club, you had to have graduated from a so Southern Baptist college, mm -hmm. I, I, and or you know have a long history with a, a family history with a, a Southern church. Mm -hmm. It was very, very Southern, Southern, <laughs> and uh, and I didn't sound Southern, mm -hmm. and I had none of those credentials, <laughs> and and you really didn't get into the club. Mm. Um, when the students were looking for churches to pastor, um, I was very fortunate. I got this little dinky church, um, Excelsior Baptist Church in Byron, where I was ordained mm -hmm. in 1966, mm -hmm. October the 2nd, 1966, I got ordained. And, uh, um, but I love to hear those guys preach. Mm -hmm. They preached so differently, uh, and but J. Winston Pierce, a professor of homiletics, we called it at that time, uh, wonderful, uh, <laughs> s spellbound. It was mm -hmm. an era of great preachers. Mm -hmm. Doctor Francis de mm -hmm. uh was became a good friend of mine, major impact on my life, mm -hmm. uh, and. I att he I attended the church he was at at Lincoln Park Baptist Church in San Francisco, uh, and he was a major major influence in my life, and what a preacher! I remember in one mission class, the initial mission class, mm -hmm. he preached on. As the Father has sent me, I so I have sent you. He preached on that verse for two or three weeks for. <laughs> In every class for two or three weeks. Wow. wow. Without, he just preached on it. Yeah. He'd, he'd start in on it. He'd just start in on it. <laughs> and he'd preach. And that's the way those guys were. Wow. They, uh, they were intensely biblically oriented, faithful Christian, strong Christian preachers. Mm. They were preachers. Yeah. They weren't speakers. They didn't stand up and give a little talk. And so the chapel times, the chapel was every day. Mm -hmm. And so in the course of the six years that I sent, spent there, mm -hmm. I heard some of the greatest Southern Baptist preachers. <laughs> um, one day yeah. I heard Dr. W.A. Criswell, First mm -hmm. Baptist Church of Dallas preach in yeah. Dallas. And um, uh, and he was in that genre. Mm -hmm. But I would say that would be the number one memory is to hear these guys preach. Yeah. It was really something. Wow. I had no idea what I was hearing. If I had, I would have recorded every single <laughs> one of them. I had known, mm -hmm. but I didn't. And the... Um, there was one of the famous sermons that was preached, uh, Diamonds. Acres of Diamonds by... Uh, yes. Conwell. Russell Conwell. So, it may have been, but uh, there, was, there was some Southern Baptist preacher would travel around and preach that sermon in that style. And... Uh, <clears throat> So it was very Southern Baptist here, and I'm a West Coaster from born in Portland, mm -hmm. went to high school in Los Angeles, and then here. <laughs> and But to hear those guys, the sermons, mm. oh. <laughs> I mean, y you could sit there, and you were, you were not happy when they quit. <laughs> they could have gone for another hour mm. or two yeah. to heck with the classes. <laughs> we're going to... This is this is it. Yeah. yeah. 
this is it. <laughs> and uh, it, it was, it, that's, I think that's the number one, Adam. Mm. That's, that was fabulous. Wow. Wow. Well, Katie, what about you? What, what are some of your favorite memories while you were studying there? Um... I mean, besides studying uh, yeah. next to me. Oh yeah, in the I, I was. That besides was just that. so fabulous. <laughs> I was amazing. I know, I know. <laughs> but I mean, besides that, um, I I just had I had a really, I mean, I just have to say I had a very good time with you young people. I'll <laughs> say, <laughs> um, and 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 I was paying quite a lot of attention to the struggles that that young people in particular, fairly young in Christian walk, mm. ha- had in terms of being presented with some of the ap- apparent contradictions in Scripture or some of the, um, the, the overtones of political nature, maybe, and mm. in maybe the Old Testament or... Just the the things that I could look around and yeah, I was experiencing some of that myself. Mm-hmm. But it it was very poignant to see young people struggling with their own faith as they were now seeing there was no m- mercy <laughs> from some of the professors. Mm. They didn't. It's not like um, they just didn't sug- sugarcoat it. Yeah, you know how that was. Yep. And and you probably went through your own struggles, but mm-hmm. it was very interesting uh, to watch that, and mm-hmm. it was also interesting to see the struggle between the two camps of growing Reformed theology folk with definitely Arminian decisionist folk, mm-hmm. and and especially were you in Shouse's class with me? No, I never. The, I got no. a chance to take a, a okay. class from him. Okay, so. I took both of the theology classes with him, and there were two aspects in that that were quite interesting, because he wanted and promoted a lot of class interaction. It was not lecture. The students themselves prepared a lot of the presentation, Mm -hmm. and then we would discuss it, and he would ask questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously, he had his own presentations, too, but there was some really wild battles in class mm-hmm. between Arminian and Reformed Calvinist-oriented uh, proponents. Mm-hmm. And there were some people that were getting very upset with other people in class. The other part of uh, that was fun for me in mm-hmm. Shouse's class was he and I are probably about the same age. Mm-hmm. And he would come up with... You know how he is very dramatic mm-hmm. because he's a thespian. <laughs> and... He would have jokes, Mm -hmm. things that would just roll off of his tongue, Mm -hmm. and he would make some kind of remark that was funny in a context of an earlier era, and I would break out laughing, (laughs) and he and I would be laughing. And like all these other students just... We would look around, and like everybody else would be (laughs) like completely blank. (laughs) What are you guys laughing at? And we would both be shrugging our shoulders and go, oh... (laughs) Had okay, got it. Yeah, you had to be there. <laughs> that w- that w- I I I thought that was that was a nice comic relief to the day. But uh, yeah. the the experience for me w- on a personal level was mm-hmm. that here was this mid fifties lady that um, this was like the sharpest time of my life in mm-hmm. terms of my thinking ability and my quickness of of brain. Mm-hmm. Just um, what was seemed like um it all it all sped up it all got sharper it was all a lot of fun and mm. and i had a lot of um soul searching to do though about certain professors who would make demands so to speak that i thought were unreasonable or that i mm. didn't agree with and i had to then come up with ways to perform anyway yeah but then everyone else did too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So I, I really liked uh, th- the fact that there was a lot more interaction. I could tell from Kent's era, where it was a lot more lecture, that the they had learned that not everyone can absorb information mm-hmm. just from hearing and watching someone speak. Mm-hmm. That 
you have to present it in a variety of ways, including group interaction. And I thought that uh, they did a fairly good job of that in most of the classes. Yeah. So that was fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, what is your most, and we'll, we'll go again to you first, and then we'll switch over. We'll mix it up a little. So, Katie, uh, what is your most prized achievement that you earned while at this campus? And you can take that however way, whatever way you would like. Literal or uh, metaphorical in, Okay, or in whatever. general, it's what I just talked about. Um, yeah. That that you know that wonderful sh- quick sharpness that that mm. developed, and the and the interaction with young people that I just cherished, mm. and just it was wonderful. That whole dynamic, in terms of actual, uh, you know, an award. Uh, I got the Borchert New Testament <laughs> Award, you know. Yeah. Well, that's right. You did get <laughs> yeah. Can you explain the Borchert New Testament Award? Well, I, frankly, I, I never understood on <laughs> what, 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 on what basis they awarded it or who made the decision, frankly. But I, I was... T- every single one of my electives was um, an exegesis Mm. either Hebrew or Greek. Mm-hmm. And I had um, Dr. Timothy Wiarda mm-hmm. for all of the Greek. Oh, yeah. Every one of the Greek things. Mm-hmm. And um, it was... Um, I thought he did a good job of presenting a, a good framework around which to hang your research and your, and your understanding. So mm. perhaps that was... He and Melek, I guess, but yeah. who else would even know? Yeah. Um, and so, in terms of something that you sit up on the shelf in your room, uh-huh. <laughs> where you can it, walk but... into the <laughs> Martin's office and say, "Yeah, you know that that was me there." Yeah. <laughs> I guess that yeah. would be the one. <laughs> All right. Well, Ken, what about you? And again, you can take that. Got no words. Got no words. The way I did things, I was so busy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, that I looked at a class and I'd say, I'm either going to get an A or a B, depending on the reading list. Mm-hmm. It was a big reading list. I'd say, this is a B here. But I liked Hebrew and Greek mm-hmm. and not a lot of reading, and so I tried to get A's in those classes. Mm-hmm. There were certain classes I went after the A's, certain B's, but I never got any awards. Mm-hmm. I probably got a, I probably had about a 3.2 Great point average. Well, then, speaking metaphorically, what would you say is your most prized achievement? From that, I love the learning. From your time with the seminary. Yeah. I love the learning. I, mm-hmm. I've always loved school. I was in the military. I had, when I graduated with my degree, I could have taken it in three different disciplines. Mm-hmm. I had to pick. Mm hmm. <laughs> between cultural anthropology, sociology, and psychology, because mm-hmm. I had so many credits. <laughs> I just, oh, I've always loved going to school. Yeah. And that was it. I, oh, yeah, when it. he researches something, the stack of books goes up here <laughs> real quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've always, I've always loved to read and to learn mm-hmm. and to write. I learned how to write at Golden Gate. Mm. That was a big deal. Mm-hmm. So that's it, that's it, Adam. Yeah. All right. Um, so our next question, we're going to start moving into about the the sale itself. Um, before the announced sale of the Mill Valley campus on April first, two thousand fourteen, what was uh, your impression of the relationship between Golden Gate's Mill Valley campus and its neighbors uh, <laughs> or surrounding community? Um, I mean, you're. As yeah, we went to the we went to the civic center meeting in mm-hmm. which they presented their whole plan yeah. mm-hmm. and the kind of pushback that they were getting mm-hmm. um, was w- it was it was not a surprise when they basically got panned. Yeah, and uh, I had wished at that point that Orge knew enough about my personal background to have brought me in on a committee because mm. I, I have commercial real estate and mm. facilities management landscape planning all that stuff I even knew the guy that was on the neighbor's side oh, I yeah. had used him myself mm-hmm. 
in the past. Mm-hmm. And I, I wish that I had had some opportunity to give some input to that process. I didn't even know what was going on. Yeah. Yeah, I think they were talking pretty quietly about it up to that point. Mm-hmm. So what what would you say before that stuff? Maybe even before the attempt uh, in 2010, 2009, yeah. uh, of the, uh, the new development plan that they tried before they decided to sell. What was your impression of how the community in this, this campus, the Golden Gate campus, interacted with each other? I couldn't Thumbs really down. say much. <laughs> I really couldn't say much. Mm. Uh, now, I've been pastor of this church for 31 years. And so I've, I'm well acquainted with, with Mill Valley and the mentality. And it's essentially an anti-Christian mentality. Okay. You, have to, you have to understand yeah. that, that that's going to be a prejudice, whether or not um, you, know, you can really nail it down, quantify it, and so on. Mm. And so there's always been a kind of um, putting up with the seminary mentality. Okay. Mm-hmm. As long as they had enough open space available for the community and and they didn't make a lot of noise or any commotion mm-hmm. or... Go ahead, sorry. But I, I just, I have a feeling that um, the, the neighbors, the people who live here, uh, don't probably overall didn't feel really kindly toward the seminary. Mm. It's it's the it's the, it's the same gospel offense that people have a, a sense of. Now I did a doctorate four years at the Presbyterian Seminary, San mm. Francisco Theological Seminary in San Anselmo, mm-hmm. and that was totally different, <laughs> totally different experience. Yeah. Um, up there, what was that like? was the, the 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 community was in love with them and oh, okay. vice versa. Yeah. It was a different a different environment here, mm. but I think it's it's because of the natural offense of the gospel. Mm. Yeah, you don't have that uh, that gospel is not quite so apparent at San Francisco Theological Seminary. Yeah. If, now, it's, now, if it's there at this all. Was, this is coupled, mm-hmm. though, what he's talking about is absolutely true, but it's coupled with a, an overall uh, affluence type of attitude in Marin of mm-hmm. a lot of nimbyism, not in my backyard. Mm-hmm. Uh, I paid good money to get come here and have my privacy, my property values stay uh, no more development anywhere that I can visually see it or mm. hear about it. Um, I, I resent how much traffic there is because those people over across the bay are now using our freeway. With with I mean it wasn't it was only a f- few months before the project was panned that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Since they panned the biggest guy in all of film history, <laughs> the Star Wars creator himself, yeah. George Lucas, mm-hmm. uh, and his plans to expand Skywalker Ranch. Mm-hmm. I mean, if they can pan George Lucas, it's not just the offense of the gospel. It's a, it's a basic Marin affluent-oriented nimbyism. Mm. Um, we will not allow anything that that isn't to our benefit. Mm. No growth. No growth. Yeah. We don't want anybody else. Yeah. You know, it... Now that when, my house is built. Yeah, that, no now that my houses. house is built, and don't be building anything smaller <laughs> next to me so that my property values go down. Well, that's mm. one of their problems with that development proposal. Mm. But um, it, in, a, in about 63, there was a proposal being put towards uh, the, the planning entities that be in Marin County mm to make a, a four-lane highway out towards the coast oh. with a lot of development. It was proposed to have, like, San Jose-style development all the way out there. Oh, okay. But it got squashed. Uh, I think it was a, a water issue. They realized that they couldn't get water That's for right. it. Oh. It was a water issue, yeah. That... Um, See, what Moran now is sitting 
fairly well. Back then, there weren't as many reservoirs connected as there are now oh, okay. that collect rainwater, but that's Marin's about 75% of Marin's water on an annual basis has to come from rainfall gathered in reservoirs. Mm. People who live out far west, the unless they're grandfathered into some kind of local community, the acreage that is minimal for development is 60. You have to have 60 acres. Mm. We'll get back to that list. Oh, yeah. That's fine. It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> you forgot. Well, but okay. you probably aren't talking to people who have been around this long, yeah. who That's are associated true. with the with the seminary yeah. and with Marin County yeah. and have been around this long. That is true. That's true. Yeah. Well, but since we're hoping for more, but that is true so far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> since you know, in that vein, one of the things that has always been a curiosity of mine is how the 82 plan got through. Do you know anything about that? Or No. Okay. I don't. I was completely ignorant. Uh, in 82, I was living in Truckee anyway. Okay. Yeah. I was. I have no idea. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Huh? No, it's... That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> I just So that's a, that the master plan time. was developed in Yeah, 82? that was the previous one that had been approved. Okay. That's the one that ran out, and they tried to get through in 2009 or 10. Yeah. It, really thrilling reading if you need to <laughs> sleep some night. Uh, back to the list. How did your opinion of the relationship between the neighbors and the seminary change, if at all, when the sale was announced? Did it improve? Did it depreciate the stay the same the relationship? Did it stay the same? Well, I just think about the uh, no Branson signs. <laughs> That's yeah, a, that is funny. There's a lot of them. <laughs> the, there, I I kind of think to myself. I snicker a little bit to myself about, oh, if they didn't like the seminary, they sure won't like the high school. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, that is very likely to be true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, they probably can block it, but the entity that bought the place can wait them out, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I guess. But I never really understood how um, entrenched the the NIMBYism attitude was in that community mm. until I heard about the development that that they couldn't get through and 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 how uh, Dr. Orge was explaining the the f- per interpersonal relationships with individual homeowners that was really very troublesome. Huh. I didn't know anything about that. We know Jim Daly very well because he's uh, he attends here and over at Tiburon, I guess also. Okay. Can you and, tell who Jim uh, Daly is? Jim Daly is an, is podcast. Jim Daly is one of the the homeowners on the the street Starter there. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget which. Yeah, and mm-hmm. he um, of course he's got a completely different kind of relationship yeah. with the seminary. That's true. He donated a, a large amount for that playground to be built. Mm-hmm. You know that play, you have um, a playground over there. Yeah, and Jim did yeah. that. Yeah, and he's a mm-hmm. Christian, and he. Come, he attends Southern Baptist churches. Yeah, you know his. He goes back and forth, and so he's he's like the polar opposite of probably the, who, the people who live right next door to him. Yeah, who would like to see any sign of Christians mm. gone? Mm. And when we talked to Doctor Orge, he mentioned that that Strawberry didn't have a neighborhood association until. The the new plan they tried to get through was oh, really? coming up, and okay. then they they organized. That's when yeah. they never had one before that. Mm-hmm. Apparently, yeah. yeah. Um, well, isn't that sweet? <laughs> Were you involved in any of the discussions with the the seminary relocation? And we've already touched on that a little bit. It sounds like you weren't. You know, the one event I remember when um, uh, Jeff Forge announced it in seminary, a, a chapel service. Uh-huh. We had heard about it, and we attended it, 
and then he invited people who wanted to discuss it to over to mm -hmm. kind of the conference room next to his office there. Mm. And Katie and I went, and there was about four other people, and <clears throat> we listened, and I, I simply commented to him that I said, I know that this is a very difficult time for you, but I think you are making the right decision to go to Ontario mm. uh, for the future of the seminary. Long aware that the professors can't afford to, to buy homes here. Mm. Uh, it, it's a financial disaster for them, some of the key years of their life. Students aren't able to really live here. Yeah. Uh, and it, um, it, just, it just presents a real problem. Whereas Ontario, that eastern part of LA, mm -hmm. is wide open spaces. You have a huge metropolitan um, population. Right. Uh, you've got 10 times, 20 times the number of churches for students to go to. Yeah, as well as housing options and work options. Well, and oh, so it's, a, it's an obvious move. Mm -hmm. And I, I told Jeff Orge, and I'm pretty sure that he was thinking, oh, from Philpott, I'm going to hear... I'm going to hear some negatives going to get me. And when I agreed with him, I said, stick with it. I think you're right on. Mm. you got to go for this. It's going to be, I said, your job is education. It's to educate people for the work of the ministry mm -hmm. and not to sit in some gorgeous location. We don't really care about that. Yeah. We don't really care about the gorgeous location and, you know, whatever might accrue to you f mm. from the place itself. The job is to more efficiently educate people to go about your work. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. Obvious move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it was it, it, and, but he, he also needed to be a good steward of the, the money, so to speak, and he had been turning down offers that just weren't going to get the, the seminary into the next phase with enough comfort to to make it work yeah. and finally something came along he would have done it a lot earlier than that sure yeah, probably. if if uh, they wouldn't have spent all the money they did on the development project if mm -hmm. if this offer had come through much earlier That's at true. the at the level that it came through because yeah. then it's like oh good fine mm. Mm. Let's we'll go. <laughs> we'll miss we'll miss a seminary, but I think it's a good move. Mm -hmm. I think the big thing that we all worry about is um, for the churches that have uh, that do depend so much on seminary students yeah. and professors and mm -hmm. professors to to be their their core. What are they going to do? Yeah. That's not our problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but a lot of other others will. Yeah. Yeah, what yeah. are they? We'll I could I can name questions. several. I mean, I can come up with at least five off the top. Yeah. That uh, what 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 are they going to do? I'm imagining certain closings or um, uh, merging mergings, is a good idea. Yeah. mergings. Yeah, yeah, mergings is a good always a good idea. Yeah, my home church did that actually in Bakersfield. Pardon? My Bakersfield? home church in, ba in Bakersfield did that. Yeah. After I left uh, for college, but uh, you know they they did do that. Yeah. 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 Five months from now is the anticipated opening date of the Ontario campus, assuming everything moves on track. <laughs> the, does that mean no summer classes anywhere, or they might they still might hold be in summer other classes at the pre-existing? Mm -hmm. There will the currently be, existing campuses, but uh, the, none here for the Bay be, Area, right? There will be courses offered in the Pacific Northwest, right. Rocky Mountain, and Arizona, right. okay. but not at Brea or yeah. um, Mill Valley. I didn't know that about Brea. Are they folding Brea in? They're going to keep Brea as it is so far. Okay, they have I don't no know where that is. To change relationship. Brea so now I hear that Fremont. Is it Fremont that mm -hmm. is having trouble getting constructed in time? There were delays last summer for the paperwork, and yeah. um, 
then with the El Nino rains, they couldn't get the foundation poured soon enough because they had to wait on the paperwork. Yeah. Uh, so they can't open it on time in the fall. Um, so that's why they're going to continue renting. Actually, this location, so the Mill Valley campus will be the Fremont campus meeting okay, yeah. in Mill Valley uh, for at least one semester, mm-hmm. maybe two. Oh. Um, Somebody's, I, I bet they're going to end up commuting a lot of people because they're not going to be able to afford living over here without being able to rent at the seminary. Yeah. And if you're Which saying maybe that they'll work not, it out, who knows? Yeah. I mean, time yeah. will tell. There also was a bit of a jurisdictional dispute over where the water runs off between the county and Caltrans. Various in Fremont? In Fremont, yeah. Now, did they buy that? It was donated. It was donated. There was a church that's moving to a house church model, and they just straight up donated the property to the seminary. And the seminary was surprised, said thank you, and then promptly knocked that old building down so they could build a, a state-of-the-art educational center with the you know classroom technology and stuff like that. So how, how many uh, classrooms will they have there? I don't recall off the top of my head. It'll be a two-story four, building, right? Four plus administrative offices. Um, I have... I can say this now. Yeah. I've officially been named the regional librarian of the, the Fremont campus. I'll Great. be working with uh, Dr. Richters, who's the the regional director for the campus, and we've who is this man? Rick Durst. Roger oh, Durst. Rick! Yeah, yeah. He's going to be a part of our ordination service coming up here. <laughs> yeah. Good, great guy. Great, I always <laughs> like Rick Durst. Great guy. Durst is his doctoral advisor too. Oh, wonderful! Was oh, that right? Okay, wonderful. He's, All right. he's why I came up here to, to mm-hmm. study. Um, it sounds like your your opinion at the move was that it was a when the move was announced that it was a good thing. Has your opinion changed any at all since then? Yeah, it's been two years since the the announcement. Has it shifted no. or no? No. Strengthened? Maybe? No. 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 We 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 definitely think that for the seminary, yeah, it's the right move. Mm-hmm. We're we're sad for anyone who either hasn't completed their education and needs to to move mm. unless that seems like great excitement for them wonderful then do it uh but um it's a wonderful resource mm-hmm. for us mm-hmm. and for all kinds of other people and now it our sense is that Marin will be even drier place than than it even is now yeah it's a loss experience. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. There's a loss experience. Uh, I've been grieving about it for quite a while, mm. and I'm, you know, but it doesn't change my opinion mm. as to the um, the good sense move. It's a good sense move. It makes mm-hmm. it. It's the right thing. Yeah, it'll sh- it'll probably indicate who really sees this area as the mission field it is. Yeah. I mean, th- this is the least Christian c- county in America. In America. Mm-hmm. The, you got more atheists in southern Marin, atheists, Wiccans, mm-hmm. no Mount Tamas, the vortex, you know. Yeah. Uh, Wiccans. Uh, atheists, Wiccan, Buddhist, and shamans. The Even shaman, Hindus. Michael Horner Shaman Institute is here in Mill Valley. Mm-hmm. And it, it, they all, all of those categories overshadow the, the Christian presence. Mm. And what Christian presence there is, is, is not that much. Because I know, mm-hmm. well, we just had our Good Friday service. We've always had it with Roman Catholic, Mount Carmel, mm. um, the Peace Lutheran, Church of Our Savior Episcopal. And... Um, the attendance of those sem- the, those Good Fridays had continued to drop, mm. and it it's just even the in, old folks go. in in the established liberal churches they're not doing well. Yeah. Uh, so there's this is as big a mission field, and this this is why I continue to stay here. Mm-hmm. This is why I'm here. Yeah. This is a perfect place for somebody like me. I'm an old time. I consider myself an old time gospel preacher. And that's why I'm here. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. 
What do you hope the seminary will prioritize as they make this historic transition? What's that, Jonathan? What do, well, you, what do you hope the seminary will prioritize after this transition? Mean when it's in, Ontar- in Ontario? Yeah. Well, as it's, the- it's going through this big transition, so what do you what do you think it should prioritize? Or what do you hope that they will include in its priorities? And that can include what you think should happen in Ontario, or what should happen in Fremont, or... It's a very open question. Helping people relocate. Helping those who are currently Mm -hmm. dependent on housing here, employment here, churches here, Mm -hmm. to, to have as little distress as possible in getting those things replaced mm. down there. Yeah. And then leaving behind help, helping in some way. I have no idea how the seminary can help with the various churches dilemmas now with losing their professors and seminary student um, teaching staff and preaching yeah. staff and yeah, that's that that that's what, of course, we worry about the most mm-hmm. is not for ourselves personally, yeah. but for our our fellow church folks right throughout the county, yeah, and into Sonoma even. Mm-hmm. That's true. Is that what you would say? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, good education. We live in a very sophisticated world. People are very much aware mm. of um, of that which is has to do with um, core beliefs. Uh, it's it's a far more sophisticated culture now, and um, I think a good solid education. Avoiding as much of the fluff stuff as possible. Mm. Uh, I've seen at <laughs> Golden Gate an increasing amount of fluff stuff. Mm. Uh, that there is some reason you can find some reason for it, but 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 a lot of it is just <clears throat> uh, not not that kind of equipping. What I what I try to do here at our church is to educate people as as well as we can. Mm. We're even thinking about a Greek and Hebrew class. We have a thing called the Saturday Seminary. Mm-hmm. This We just finished up the second year. We just finished the Islamic studies. And uh, the rest of the time is going to be uh, try to get through to modern-day church history. Mm. Uh, we're in about the 8th century now. Mm-hmm. Um, only two more months to go, and I'm going to speed it up. But uh, <laughs> people need to be aware a good... Theological education, uh, because we we uh, we're meeting the, the culture is far more advanced, far more aware, mm. and good mm-hmm. education. But the basic the, the basic, basic stuff. Mm. But the average Christian knows zilch about theology, really, mm. one doctrine versus another. They wouldn't. They don't even know what you mean by reformed or Arminian or, or they they just don't. They don't know other than what they're told from the pulpit and a lot of the what is um, preached from the pulpit is topical feel good. Mm-hmm. Are they going to get it if if they all go away? Adam, there's a book right there, right there. That that's one of my new books, mm-hmm. and it it's it deals with um. um uh, you guys, I, I'm going to give you three books so you can have those. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, it deals with uh, shamanism, Santeria, mm-hmm. Wicca, and charisma. And um, uh, I, I find that, that most people don't know anything about these. We, we have uh, various sources, mm-hmm. but we have literally thousands and thousands of contacts Every single week, mm. dealing nothing but with Santa Maria. Thousands, and this has gone on for years, after wow. year after year, in our online mm-hmm. journal. Mm-hmm. 
our, our videos. I get vid. I I have about two hundred videos mm. on YouTube, and mm. every single day, every single day, I get contact with by shamans, mm. Santerians, <laughs> Wiccans <laughs> from all over the world. Wow. I have Angry to deal. With, <laughs> I have to deal with it every every day. Every day, mm. it's huge. It's huge. Most people, even in seminaries, don't know about this stuff. Mm. They don't know about Islam. Yeah, we we live in a world where it's important to understand uh, Muslim theology. The I'm going to give you. I'm going to. This is mm. my newest newest book. I'm going to give you each a copy of that. I only see one here. That that's written for Muslims. I go to the mosque here in Mill Valley. Mm -hmm. um, I'm meeting next Thursday with the uh, Abdullah, uh, the chief Imam's son, okay. who's really running the uh, running running the mosque. It's a Sunni mosque, mm -hmm. mostly from India and Pakistan. But um, uh, I've had the Imams over here several times, uh, both Shia and Sunni. Most Christians don't know anything about Islam. You're going to know everything you need to know about Islam after you read that book. Mm. That is a book directed at Muslims. Mm. But it's, it's really, an outreach. It's really Christians who will want it in order to be able to speak to them. It's mm. an outreach to moderate or progressive Muslims. And uh, my new, my second book, it's just about about done about a month and a half. It's just going to be called Islamic Studies, mm. and it's based on all kinds of stuff. It's mm. really be interesting. So we have an outreach mm. to Muslim people now. Yeah. Um, and I've been writing on it since 2001. But but that kind of stuff needs to be taught. Mm -hmm. We need to, people need to understand what, what shamanism is, how ubiquitous it is, and how to identify it in the culture and the pagan, the neo-pagan mm -hmm. cults like Wicca. And that's only one name of yeah, a couple dozen of neo-pagan hmm. witchcraft-like things. Yeah, Santeria, one of the world's largest religions in the world, 180 million Santerians in Brazil alone. Hmm. 180 million. How many Christians even know about Santeria? There, it's called Macumba or Candoble. Cuba is almost 100 percent. It's Lacumai. In Haiti, it's a voodoo. Hmm. It's Everyone big knows, in Miami. As soon as you say voodoo, <laughs> oh, oh, and people don't even know about <laughs> Yeah. And by the head guys, Babalaos, and people in, in ministry don't even know about this. None of the pastors here of the other churches, hmm. you know, they don't know anything about this stuff. Hmm. I give them the book. It's everywhere now. At the um, at the Good Friday service, I gave to the. The, the Episcopal, the Catholic, mm -hmm. and the, the other people. I give them, I have to get a hold of Mike, Mike, from the Mother of Mount Carmel. Um, I gave him a copy of If Allah Wills. Mm. These, they don't know anything. Uh, 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 yeah, there's a big seminary in, right here. <laughs> in seminary yeah. in Ontario, there is a huge Islam, uh, a Muslim Sunni ghetto here in Mill Valley. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Mm -hmm. I know I know a lot of them. Yeah. They all know me. <laughs> and uh, they they used to think I was converting. Mm -hmm. They brought me to a conversion ceremony well African American not too long ago. They wanted me to see. They thought I was converting. Oh yeah. But they know different now. <laughs> but anyway, you were, anyway but I would like to see this kind of stuff taught in in a seminary. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a a, a, a year study, three unit course mm. on Islam and and some of these religions because that's who lives here. Mm -hmm. These are the people we're trying to evangelize. These are the trying to speak the gospel, and they're a growing percentage of the population. Yeah, atheism, one of the major isms. I don't know what it is. Um, I'm gonna go. Did you did you leave the door. front door open? Yeah, of the but office? not the office. Anything I would like to courses on. Mm -hmm. The wall. Oh. It's, it's you know, what do, what, do the, what do people believe? Mm -hmm. That needs to be taught. Yeah. In a mission evangelism, but, um, but it teaches you theology as well. Mm -hmm. Well, slightly to 
ease your concern there. Uh, Dr. Don Dent will be teaching mm -hmm. uh, global worldviews. Mm -hmm. Who will? Don, Don Dent. Dent. Oh, Don Dent. Yeah, he's we good. know him, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know Don Dent. Mm -hmm. He's going to be teaching yeah, uh, uh, comparative religions mm -hmm. course uh, mm -hmm. next semester at the good. Ontario campus. Good, good, good. You know, there's no better way to learn about your own and except to compare it to somebody else's. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. Well, why do they say that Jesus is not God or that he didn't even die on the cross? What do we say? Mm. We, we used to study Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Christian science. All that's good stuff. Yeah. But that stuff is minimal. Um, you know, we're going to have to get on the road okay. after a little while, you guys. And I want to give you those books. And, what uh, other books? You, I mean, you can always take a copy of the memoirs. There's lots of uh, mentions of Golden Gate Seminary in there. Thank you. You know this. Well, we'll and we've got a new one part up now. Then real quick, What's that? Just, we'll okay. just wrap up the wrap podcast up. Okay. Up now. Just thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate this. That was Kent and Katie Philpot, ministers local to the Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary, Mill Valley Campus. Well, Jonathan, what did you especially enjoy about? our conversation with Kent and Katie. I enjoy studying church history, mm -hmm. and it's one of the things I've enjoyed is reading about the history of our institution and the pe the theologians who've come through here. Yeah. It was fun to hear the the dynamic that um that Ken had, the the real deep enjoyment of the teaching of these these fine theologians who've helped um, shape uh, theology in the West. Mm. Yeah. He had a real, I think, strong connection with them, feelings about their contributions to his education as well as uh, generally to all of the students that came through their classes. Totally agree. Um, I also enjoyed his thoughts and reminiscences about the uh, chapels that he got to experience while a student here. If if anything is clear, if if you only get one thing, I feel out of this interview, it's that Kent Philpot really connected with the chapel services while he was an MDiv student at Golden Gate. You know, sometimes the way to learn how to do something is listening to or watching a master at their craft. Yeah, and it sounds like he got to do that. Yeah, he was, man, he was really excited and grateful for everything he experienced there. One other thing I particularly enjoyed was their complimentary, their two-handed um, perspective on the relationship of the seminary campus and the surrounding community. Yeah, it's one thing to have grown up in a Christian or a Baptist background and go to a Baptist seminary. Yeah. It's another thing to be a new believer and not know Baptist thought and culture and come into the middle of a Baptist educational institution. So they have quite different experiences mm -hmm. but both important and valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a wonderful um, two-part dynamic, as we talked about at the beginning of the episode. To have the two of them together was um, very, very interesting to me. We would like to talk about some projects that they are connected with. The first one we'd like to talk about is with Arbella Studios and Irwin Brothers Entertainment. They are producing the Jesus Revolution uh, it's a documentary about the Jesus movement in the 1960s and 70s. That film is based in part on Kent Philpott's own memoirs about being a, uh, a member of the Jesus People movement in that era. Um, you, can, you can look up more about the film on christianfilmdatabase.com. It has an entry there that describes what the documentary is going to examine, what it's going to be like, and I believe we can look forward to seeing that sometime in 2016. 
On that same note, Kent and Katie Philpott manage a publishing house, Earth and Vessels Publishing. Their web address is evpbooks.com. They cover all kinds of subjects in their published materials. They uh, talk about other faiths, such as Islam and Santeria and others. They have books that give support to pastors of small churches. And uh, among all of those books, they also publish one called Awakenings in America and the Jesus People Movement, which is that memoir I mentioned just a moment ago. One of the inspirations for that film, The Jesus Revolution. So I'm looking forward to that film. I'd really like to see their take on that slice of American history in the middle of the previous century. Before our interview, I actually had not met uh, Kent and Katie. Uh, the only way I knew their their names was from their books. Mm -hmm. And they seem to be pretty popular books coming from the library, both among our students and I've filled more than one interlibrary loan request for, mm -hmm. uh, for their books as well. Yeah. They graciously gave a co us copies of uh, some of their most recent works, and yeah. I would encourage uh, people to check out their writings. Yeah, it's it's very engaging in style and subject matter. Their one of their recent books is about um, some alternative faiths that aren't as discussed in um, the more public circles and Christian polemics and apologetics such as uh, the aforementioned Santeria and so on. Uh, so I would I would definitely dig into that. Well, we'll dig into something new two weeks from now. Our next episode is with PhD student Jared Jenkins studying alongside Jonathan and myself at Golden Gate Seminary. He is also one of the pastors at Risen Life Church in Salt Lake City. He is a co-host of the podcast called Salty Believer Unscripted, and because he doesn't have enough to do, he is a blogger at entrustedwiththegospel.com. Jared sounds like a pretty busy guy. I <laughs> yeah. think it'll be a great episode. It was good to get him to sit down with us, well, with you at first, <laughs> and I got to join you about halfway through. Our episodes are released every two weeks with an interview right here on iTunes, YouTube, or your favorite podcasting app. Now, Windows Mobile will never die. <laughs> Episode 7 with Jared Jenkins will be available July 8th. Your zombie OS persists. <laughs> As always, we ask you to subscribe. Uh, please don't miss any episodes. We are grateful for your listens. Also, if you would be so kind as to give us a rating in your app uh, or whatever platform you use, whether that's a, a thumbs up like on YouTube or uh, one of the star ratings on iTunes or something else, we would greatly appreciate it. As well as a written review to let people know that there's some substance here that might interest them. Since that's all from us and we don't have any more Windows Phone jokes, we're going to go ahead and end. May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. <laughs>